Hello everybody. Welcome to another instalment of Jono's Graveyard Jaunts. If you are enjoying the contents of the channel so far, can I please ask you to like and subscribe so we can venture further afield to ever more interesting places. Today we are at the beautiful and quintessentially English village of Tamworth in Arden in the undulating Warwickshire countryside. The picturesque English village is dominated in the centre with the beautiful church and churchyard of St Mary Magdalene and this is also the final resting place of the person who features in today's video. The map shows where Tamworth in Ireland sits in relation to the UK. Today we are going to be talking about a folk icon. I personally love this man's music as not only is the music itself timeless and very emotively beautiful, but also complemented by the extremely clinical guitar finger picking and the actual melodies themselves. You can hear the frag fragility in this person's voice. And what I've read about this man is that many people discovered him inadvertently, but once they did discover him, they like me were instantly hooked. Today's video is about a man by the name of Nicholas Rodney Drake. Here is some footage is what is believed to be Nick Drake at a festival, walking away from the camera. Nick is the very tall man with the dark jacket and jeans, the tallest man in the footage. It is believed to be Nick by those who knew him because of his stature and his gait, i.e. the way he actually walks. <coughs> Nick was born on the 19th of June 1948 in Rangoon, Burma, in India. His father Rodney was an engineer and the family moved to Rangoon in Burma in the 1930s. Rodney worked for the Bombay Burma Trading Company. In 1934, Rodney met Molly Lloyd, who in turn was the daughter of a senior member of the Indian Civil Service. And here is some footage of the Drake family out in Burma. The family returned from India in 1950 and moved to the very beautiful village of Tamworth in Arden in Warwickshire, where the family bought and lived in a very large house by the name of Farley's on the outskirts of the village. Rodney, Nick's father, became the chairman and managing director in 1952 of Wosley Engineering, a car manufacturer. Nick's older sister Gabrielle had studied at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts and had become a successful screen actress. One of the more famous roles was, was that of Lieutenant Gay Ellis in the 1970s sci-fi classic UFO, where Gabrielle adorned a purple wig. Gabrielle Drake is the very personification and embodiment of an English rose, classically stunningly beautiful with a finely clipped upper middle class English accent. And here is some footage of Gabrielle talking about her brother Nick very fondly in a documentary that was made after his death. Here on the album chart is Nick's sister, actress Gabrielle. Good afternoon to you. Good to meet you. Nice to be here. Thank you so much. So uh, I would imagine, and Nick died nearly 30 years ago. That's right. There must have been a long period of time when you really didn't want to talk about him. No, quite the contrary. I think if you lose someone that you're very close to, you actually want to talk about them more. They become more present to you in a way, and the only way of really dealing with your grief is to talk about them. And he only sold about 4,000 albums in his lifetime, something, something like By that. Something like that. I mean, now we end up with Brad Pitt narrating his yes. his life story. It's an extraordinary turnaround. How long was it before word got out that actually Nick had been a genius? I think word was always out that he was a genius, but it didn't get out very loudly and clearly. There were people who knew about him, but you know, even in my mother died in 1993. Nick's mother Molly was also a singer and her songs bore the same fragility as Nick's would later on. Encouraged by his mother, Nick began to learn the piano from an early age. And in 1957, Nick went to Eagle House Preparatory School near Sandhurst, then five years later to the highly prestigious private school Marlborough College in Wiltshire. Nick was very sporty at school and became an established 100 to 200 yard sprinter and he represented the team open in 1966 in this sport. Nick was also an accomplished rugby player. School friends recall Nick as being confident, often aloof and quietly authoritative. 
And his headmaster at school said about Nick, and I quote, none of us seemed to know him very well. Nick neglected his studies for the guitar, and in 1965, Nick paid £13, the equivalent of about £160 in 2022, for his first acoustic guitar. Nick started experimenting immediately with open tunings and finger picking. In 1967, Fairport Convention had organised a series of gigs to protest against the Vietnam War. And one of those gigs took place in that year at the Roundhouse in London. And Nick, in turn, was invited to play on Linda Card and performed about three songs. Ashley Hutchins, the bass player and founder of Fairport Convention, had hung around to watch the various artists play and in turn had watched Nick Drake play. He was immediately struck by Nick's quality of guitar playing and music. And after Nick's set, Ashley introduced himself to Nick and requested Nick's telephone number, of which Nick obliged. Ashley then got in touch with the record producer, Joe Boyd, and in turn passed Joe Boyd Nick Drake's telephone number. And Joe Boyd in turn rang Nick, who was both shocked and pleasantly surprised by Joe's call. Nick dropped off a tape to Joe in turn, who played it immediately and recognised Nick's talent. Nick's talent. The year was now 1968. Nick signed a record contract that year with Island Record. He was 20 years old at the time. Joe and Nick, Joe and Nick went into the studio and produced Nick's first album, Five Leaves Left, which was recorded in July of 1969. The album's title is a reference to having only five skins left from a Risley packet, as Nick was a keen pot smoker at the time. Now, Five Leaves Left received poor marketing from Ireland Records and did not achieve any commercial success. The album was very unkindly described by Melody Maker at the time as a cross between, and I quote, folk and cocktail jazz. Joe Boyd's response to the lack of commercial success was to get straight back into the studio with Nick and Nick's second album, Brighter Later. This album featured a more tempo and jazz-influenced sound. And again, this second album flopped and sold nearly 3,000 copies and again received mixed reviews. This lack of commercial success hit Nick very hard and as a result, he spiralled into depression. Nick in turn left Joe Boyd at this point and started working with a new producer, John Wood on his third and final album, Pink Moon. This was recorded in two midnight sessions at the Sound Technique studio. A Pink Moon is a side that something bad and ominous is going to happen, which is obviously a very prophetic thing. My track, my favourite track on this album, and this is all extremely good by the way, is a track entitled Road, as it has beautiful finger picking, which I think is a masterpiece. And the track Place to Be is also an awesome song in my opinion. Again, Pink Moon did not receive the commercial acclaim Nick was hoping for. And the year was now 1972. And Nick left London as a result of his lack of commercial success. And he withdrew to his parents' house in Tamworth and Tamworth in Arden where deep depression set in. Nick was prescribed trips at all for his depression which put some balance back into his life but one of the side effects was absent-mindedness and extreme confusion. On one occasion, Gabrielle, Nick's sister, was contacted by the police as Nick was marooned at a zebra crossing, unable, unwilling and undecided whether or not to cross the road. The final 18 months of Nick's life were characterised by a slow and steady decline and this manifested itself in Nick's inability to communicate and his tendency to withdraw completely into himself. Molly, Nick's mother, recounted hearing Nick one morning, and I quote, saying, I've failed in every single thing I've done. Nick would often in turn drive for miles in his car and then run out of petrol in the middle of nowhere and ring his father, Rodney, for help. He found driving therapeutic in lots of ways and it seemed to help him with his depression. This time frame had all happened in a three year period. Nick quit in Cambridge for music and now Nick had become a complete and very gaunt silent figure haunting Farley's. Now whilst Farley's itself is a very large house, Nick's room was a very small, simple room with a circular window in it. His room consisted of a single bed with a plain wooden chair with a cane seat. Near to the bed and next to the window, there was an old wooden desk which hung a life of flowers, a still life of flowers in a vase. 
Nick went to bed on November the 24th, 1974 and never came back. And Nick was just 26 years old when he died. Nor, who was the Drake's ha uh, housemaid at the time, went into Nick's room on November the 25th of 1974 and found Nick lying across the bed and in turn called Molly, who checked on Nick and found him dead. And the autopsy revealed that Nick had taken an overdose of antitryptoline and then died as a result. Molly in 1979 on a Dutch radio interview recalled Nick going to bed early on his last night on earth. And Nick was standing in the doorway and Molly asked him, and I quote, are you going off to bed, Nick? And that was the last time Molly Drake ever saw Nick alive. Nick is buried here at the beautiful St Mary Magdalene Churchyard in Tamworth in Arden, alongside Molly and Rodney, who passed away in 1993 and 1988, respectively. And this is the final resting place of Nicholas Rodney Drake. It's really beautiful here. It's incredibly peaceful. And the actual churchyard itself is perched on a hill. So if I just show you, those are the rolling Warwickshire countryside. And we're just coming up to Nick's grave now. And it's actually under this tree. There is an inscription on it. Um, and it's taken from Nick's third and final album, Pink Moon. It's the last track on the album. It's called From the Morning. And there are some lines in there. Now we rise and we are everywhere. And that is a great epitaph for Nick because... Obviously, whilst in his lifetime he never achieved any commercial success or indeed critical acclaim, after his death he generated a worldwide audience and fan base, and he's absolutely massive now. So here it is, the final resting place of Nicholas Rodney Drake, his mother Molly, and his, uh, his father Rodney. And here we are, guys, and I'll show you the inscription on the back. So this is the grave itself. It's absolutely well worth a visit. Thoroughly recommend coming out here. It's not only a beautiful village, the churchyard itself is so pretty and peaceful. So we're going to go around the back and you'll, I'll just read the inscriptions actually engraved on the back. Now we rise and we are everywhere. So here we are, it's under this tree here guys. There we are, I'll just get that because it's worth reading. The Drake family grave is private property. Please do not place any adornments apart from small floral tributes and messages out or near the grave space. Thank you. So here we are. And this is actually the back of the gravestone. You can read the inscription. Now we rise and we are everywhere. So what will Nick's legacy be then? John Martin, who was Nick's friend and Ireland record label mate, wrote the album Solid Air for and about Nick Drake, and the title track Solid Air is dedicated to Nick Drake. Dream Academy's Life in a Northern Town includes a dedication to Nick also on its sleeve. Nick Drake has influenced many artists over the years, such as Kate Bush, The Cure, Paul Weller, The Black Crows, Beck and Robin Hitchcock, to name a few. Gabriel Drake once said about Nick, Nick was born with a skin too few, and he really was. He was far too sensitive and fragile for this world. Gabriel Drake now looks after Nick's estate as both Rodney and Molly have passed away. <laughs> 